What is up, Humanoid Nation? Our next wrestling video for today will be from the GOAT himself, Brian Zane, Wrestling with Regret. The best of the worst, a brief history of Jobber Stable. Hey, he had the Mean Street Posse on there as the thumbnail, and I'm into the Mean Street Posse. All right, so let's see what Brian Zane has to say. Let's do this. Hey, hey let's do it, do it for the content. content. Mega Ray. Let's go. Greatest intro ever. Let's get it. Kick, kick city. It gets pretty when Mega Ray come through. The kid gets busy. Work yourself into a shoot, but you know it's legit. Like what you like, just don't be a dick. Hey, that's no way. It's regret. Let's, let's get it. Yeah. What's that scent? Maybe you should bottle it. Drink it and spray it on. Get called to model it. Eight years in, can't look back. Who else can make the lost sweatsuits look whack? Factions, stables, call them what you will, but putting a bunch of wrestlers together in a big group is one of the most effective, time-tested ways to get a bunch of people over with the crowd at one time. You know all the famous ones. The, the Horsemen, Horsemen. The Heenan Family. The New World Order. Degeneration. The good X, ones, but Bullet which one were the worst? The Shield. The New Day. The Union. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Yet. Wrestling's rich tapestry is filled to the brim with stables, big and small. ECW loves putting people in the groups. Sometimes any old randos could be part of a wrestler's entourage there. AEW today is lousy with them, borrowing from the New Japan model. And in WWE, three at a time is about as... I gotta admit, though, when AEW started, I was getting so annoyed with all the random stables every other fucking week. But now, like, three, four years in, I'm, I'm used to it. Like, hey... Yeah, New Japan does it, so why not with AEW? So, stables galore, it doesn't phase me in, anymore. As far as I like to go. Like all good things in wrestling, the success of those all-time great stables has sadly led to a lot of folks trying and- John Cena killed the Nexus. To capture lightning in a bottle. But me, I love myself a good faction. Like I've often mentioned on this channel, I became a fan in 1998, right in that sweet spot of DX versus the nation. The corporation began to form, and then there was the Job Squad. When I was a kid, the Job Squad was lit, lit as fuck. Tag team that formed in November of 98. A trio they were there to the lose, but they were lit as fuck. Years of poor win-loss records and questionable gimmicks. It was one of the first real new angles I remember watching from its inception. So I was strangely invested in the successes and failures of the squad. Al Snow, Bob Holly, and Two Cold Scorpio got a couple of wins Lumini, here and there, and Gilbert. people helped Dwayne Gill beat Christian to become the light heavyweight champion, but overall it was truth in advertising, as the lads were forced to look up at the lights more often than not. The group officially ended in February of 99 after Snow and Holly famously brawled into the Mississippi River over the Hardcore Championship. And Hardcore Holly was bored. If we didn't have the job squad, we wouldn't have Hardcore Holly. It was witnessing the rise and fall of the job squad where I first learned about the idea of jobber stables, groups of guys who were basically there to exist as bodies for bigger stars and not much else. Shortly after the squad came and went, the WWF was blessed by the arrival of the Mean Street Posse. My boys, the I Mean Street Posse. What began as one or two appearances to help build the Shane McMahon X Pac feud of early '99, where's Joey into a Numbers? Time run for Rodney and Pete Gas. The two legit childhood friends of Shane O'Mac were the absolute definition of corporate nepotism when they impressed the higher up so much with their antics, they got to stick around and actually train to wrestle on the job. But as entertaining as they were, such love. Rodney and Pete Gas were trained. Joey Abs was actually a wrestler to put him in there to help him. Uh, known as Venom, part of the Hardy Boys crew in North Carolina. Yeah. Buck had a ceiling. The group, which eventually added a third member in Joey Abs, was mid card fodder at best, and the guys were eventually phased out from the company after a run in developmental. And over on WCW, for example, they had the NWOB team. Forged out of the great NWO merger following the finger poke of doom, this is where all the riffraff went while Hogan, Vincent. Hall, Nash, and the other real stars were in the Wolfpack elite. Guys like Stevie Ray, Vincent, Scott Norton, and Brian Adams rarely evoked praise or victories and spent more time fighting among themselves than anyone else in WCW. By the time Stevie won the right to lead the B-team, there was hardly an NWO worth representing. Man, Stevie Ray As was the only WCW good thing about the B-team. The B-team's crap booking was heavily referenced by its spirit Spiritual successor, the Alliance in 2001. Ugh. Thank you. The point is, some stables are formed. With Bad memories of the Alliance, but how they got there, how it began, it was cool until Stephanie McMahon came out, and then it was just went all downhill from there. Up, and others are formed to build those other guys up. 
This week we're looking through the best of the worst, wrestling's most infamous job-tastic stables through the years. <laughs> money, money, money. Let's start off strong, strongly terrible that is, the Million Dollar Corporation. Was it? They were a job or tag team? Yeah, yeah, they were, now that I look back on it. Come on. Kama, King Kong Bundy, the Donka. Yeah, now I was like, okay, yeah, I was, they are, I gotta admit it. I, I, I'm in mad delusion right here. Before debut was I like this team. Auspicious. Ted DiBiase had recently come back to the Federation after a hiatus and being forced to retire due to a back injury. DiBiase's first charge as a manager was who well, else? Or Seven year old Nikolai Volkov. I should have seen it. I should have seen it there as a jobber team just by the fact that he got Boris Zukov. But I was in, in denial. I was in denial. <laughs> Brought in as Virgil 2.0, DiBiase bought Nikolai's contract for the simple thrill of harassing and embarrassing him, even going so far as to put sense emblems on his gimmick. Things would improve slightly upon the arrivals of DiBiase's old partner, IRS Irwin. and Bam Bam Bigelow. Bam. It wasn't okay, Bam Bam and Irwin were the great thing about it. The they were the good things yeah, about the million dollar team. Around them. Tatanka's heel turn on Lex Luger and the disastrous Undertaker vs. Underfaker match at SummerSlam. As the months went by, we saw IRS and Kama Mustafa fight the dead man over his urn. And even 41-year-old King Kong Bundy was dusted off to fight him. So wait, you're telling me that Ted DiBiase, who had always been portrayed as both very rich and very smart, could only find guys like Volkov and Bundy for his super group? Why not bring back Ken Patera and the Iron Sheik, making a Macabia Mania reunion? The MDC gave fans some of the worst Lawrence Taylor. from 1995. No. Bam Bam Bigelow versus Lawrence Taylor at WrestleMania Ugh, comes to mind as the such final a match of the much shit. maligned King of the Ring 95. C Members oh God. cycled in and out with little fanfare, with everyone from Henry Godwin to Sid getting involved. Even the 123 kid turned heel on Razor Ramon to join them. After it was all said and done, Ringmaster Steve Austin would be the final member of the Million Dollar Corporation in January of 96. And he was the Ringmaster. that was short-lived as DiBiase was written out of the... Why in the fuck would you make Ringmaster not talk and have Ted DiBiase talk for him? Stone Cold was known for talking. WWE but during that time, man, it can be weird. Product after signing a deal with WCW. And speaking of which, stop me if you heard this one, okay? So, a Tongan, a laughing man, one of the nasty boys, a karate fighter, and a one-hit wonder from the 60s walk into a bar, and they suck. It's the first family. Jimmy Hart's Shit, original. Shit, I forgot first about the first family. family. Time staple of Memphis Wait, wrestling. The original first family? Of foils for Jerry Lawler to beat at the height of his popularity. Or WCW's then first family. Managerial run in the WWF in the 80s and 90s, managing some of the best tag teams of the era. Compared to all that, WCW's half hearted attempt at a family revival seemed like an afterthought, just a way to keep Jimmy happy, which in turn kept the Hulkster happy. The group formed out of the rubble of the Dungeon of Doom, another group of disposable goons, when Hart took Hugh Morris and the Barbarian and lumped them in with Jerry Flynn and Brian Knox. Who the fuck is Jerry Flynn? To this day, I have no clue who this man is. I always thought it was Jerry Lynn jacked up and cut his hair and dyed his hair. But no, I was surprised that there were two different people. But still, who the fuck is Jerry Flynn? I'm just because. The group lasted in some form or fashion from 1997 to 1999, but never had much to show for it. Untimely injuries kept derailing their momentum. Then finally, Vince Russo's arrival as bro, the Bro, I say bro, ratings, bro. One of the only smart booking decisions of his entire WCW run. Besides the fact that no one from that group was going to set the world on fire, it felt like a big waste of time for everybody involved. And with the NWO still running around, that meant it was going to be an uphill battle for any heel team to get a foothold, injuries or not. Although Jimmy was great in his time, perhaps his involvement as the sneaky pipsqueak manager was holding the other members down. As good as he was in the role, his particular brand of management felt somewhat dated in a time where everything was getting grittier and more reality-based. Hang on, did I just say grittier and more reality-based? Time to take that idea to its next logical step. Race baiting! Yes, the gang oh, wars. Oh, gang wars! Oh, I'm the only one that liked this storyline. Everyone I talked to just hated this thing. Come on, Gang Wars, Los Boricuas, DOA, The Nation of Domination, D-Generation X, Art Foundation. And I'm talking about AEW having way too many stables. This was back then when they had way too many stables, but I was young and stupid.
foundation of domination and the heart foundation were doing the wwf decided in the Jewish commission that everyone should be in a stable and they should all fight each other in june of that year farouk fired crush and savio vega from the nation and the ex-members went on to form their own color-coded gangs in response Crush formed the biker gang known as the Disciples of Apocalypse with Chains, Skull, and 8-Ball. Meanwhile, Vega built a team of fellow Puerto Ricans, Miguel Perez, Jesus Estrada, and Jose Castillo, known as Los Bariquas. Now, you would think that a feud involving three men, which then expanded into a feud involving roughly a dozen men, would be about four times as exciting, right? <laughs> Wrong. While the nation moved on and eventually evolved, DOA and the Bariquas feuded endlessly and fruitlessly throughout 97, to the point where At it the end, it was starting to get really boring. The of the Wrestling Observer. It's when it first started, it was awesome, but then it got really boring after. Truth Commission, but aside from maybe one or two encounters at the very end, the South African militants were nowhere near this action. Talk about a missed opportunity slash dodged bullet. Like so many other stables who are given that initial push before the higher-ups lose interest, DOA and the Bariquas soon settled into a rut that was hard to get out of. DOA spent most of 98 feuding with the Legion of Doom, but the guys from Puerto Rico became a complete afterthought after Savio Vega left the company. Jose, Jesus, and Miguel were relegated to jobbing on shows like Shotgun and Super Astros before all leaving the company in September of... I forgot about Super Astros! Damn! That was awful! It's awful! 99. Now, the gang wars might have flopped, but by no means was that the end of stables in the WWF. Less than a year later, they brought out a whole new group with an old crappy twist. Shane Douglas, one last word from you, pal. And they can all kiss, kiss my ass. ass. I thank my lucky stars that I began watching wrestling when I did, and not a moment sooner because I may have been turned off entirely from watching the NWA invade the world. I totally wrestling. missed out on this whole entire storyline. Organization that hadn't been relevant since breaking away from WCW five years ago. And I think that's a good thing that I missed out on the entire NWA storyline. Needed to finally beat that cool and edgy WCW in the ratings war. The invasion that was meant to restore honor to the WWF began at the very end of '97 with a four-minute match for the NWA North American title that saw Memphis and. Aztec warrior Jeff Jarrett defeat Black Jack Barry Windham. Then Steve Austin came out after the bell to hit Jarrett with a stunner and leave, killing the movement's credibility on day one. Yep. It kind of cooled the Rock and Roll Express that had somewhat of a career renaissance in the independence the last several years, considering how close they were to being deemed too far past their prime 24 years ago. But they, along with a newly turned Barry Windham, would join Double J and Cornette in their cause and were awarded the NWA World Tag Titles. YJC would align himself with the team he had on always Raw? feuded against. God, I did miss his guess. entire angle. But that was a leak to their problems creatively, as most of the group's matches had bullshit finishes brought on by rampant cheating by Cornette. Oh yes, what a nice return to wrestling's roots this has been. Then out of nowhere, Jeff Jarrett up and left the group, the next nail in the coffin. You know the group is bad when its apparent star decides he'd rather go back to his Porter Wagner ripoff gimmick than be the North American champion. Cornette soon traded up when he replaced Morton and Gibson with the Bart Gunn and of Bodacious Bart Bodacious and Bob. <sighs> I'm just Bombastic saying Bobby Bob. was still active during this time. You're telling me they couldn't have bought him away from Turner for this? Well, on second thought, probably for the best they didn't do that. And to make matters worse, even Dan Severn couldn't be bothered to spend long in the stable that bore the name of the organization of which he was the world's heavyweight champion. However, Severn debuting his immaculate theme music was the best thing to come out of this angle. The group's highest profile match came at King of the Ring 98 when the new Midnight lost a match for the WWE. Funny thing about this is even Billy Gunn and Road Dogg don't remember any of this. There was like a shoot interview where like a guy asked him, it's like, so what was uh, like wrestling the new Midnight Express? And they both look at each other it's like, what the hell are you talking about? Like you guys don't remember? It's like, they both, it's like, no, it was like, that was hilarious. I forgot what shoot interview it was, but that was the one where, like, they were talking mad shit about Triple H. Yeah, this was before TNA. Yeah. But, yeah, it was hilarious them not remembering anything about this goddamn match. Tag titles against the New Age Outlaws. Then Bart and Bob would fight each other in the brawl for all. Cornette would retire as a manager in protest, and that was it for the NWA until about four years later. I'm not saying it should have worked out, especially given the creative direction the company was heading during this time, but it could have worked out. Maybe if the wrestlers were given more time in their matches. Talk on Michinoku. He was a he was teams, the goat. Could have been better. But instead, the, the heavyweight division storyline faded into the ether like the territories it was based on. 
if you want to talk about an invasion that worked for a few you weeks, see w97 jump way ahead in the timeline to talk about the nexus there's a whole video ah uh, the nexus years ago but here are the are we going to talk about 2.0 nexus or the core hell on the main roster before losing their first big match at SummerSlam. as they started out strong Nothing until that summer slap match their trajectory took a huge unrecoverable hit as a result the team's collapse lasted almost four times as long as their ascent, constantly getting one up by guys like by John one Cena guy, and that man is the king so himself, finally, John Cena. Punk led a coup and kicked Wade Barrett out as leader. But before I touch on that, let's first show some love to the man, the legend, the one constant, and so many of the next teams I'm going to talk about here, Heath Miller. The man once known as Heath Slater may have been one of the best hands WWE had in the last 15 years. He's got years. kids. Not only did he spend an awful long time in the company, he bopped around from jobber stable to jobber stable over the years as well. And they don't trust just anyone with that kind of creative. Slater would walk away from CM Punk's new Nexus, which was a good call since that version of the group somehow did even worse than the first. You still Instead, have David Dutonga in Gabriel it. Gabriel formed the core alongside Barrett and Ezekiel Jackson. The Bad Logo Boys did peak with some tag team and icy title wins, but then things fell apart after WrestleMania when they lost in less than two minutes. Ah, that Michael friends. Cole, Jerry Lawler mania. In June of 2011, and after Heath spent years languishing in the lower card by himself, the time finally came for him to languish in the lower card with friends again. Free <laughs> MB. That's right, party people, it's the three-man band. Slater, Jinder Mahal, and Drew McIntyre were three guys with Zilch Jinder Mahal before he got all swole and look normal do before they were thrown together and told to make it work and despite counting a lot more don't get me wrong i like jinder i liked him as champion i'm, I'm not afraid to admit it but i like jinder as champion what the hell was i talking about again lights and platinum records the group managed to carve out their own special spot in history no it wasn't meant to be taken seriously but the trio still created plenty of memorable moments like the wlc match and Okay, that was pretty much their biggest highlight, but that was still rad as hell. It's made all the more amazing when you realize that two out of three of its members are now former WWE champions, when at the time, that prize couldn't have been much further away from them. If you can come out the other side of that gimmick and continue to thrive, you're doing something right. 3MB ended unceremoniously in June of 2014, when Drew and Jinder were released from their contracts, leaving Heath all alone. And Rhino, oh, a Rhino Fast came along. Another two years. Oh Slater yeah, Titus. Come and gone, and the one man band Slater Gator. On horizon with the social outcasts comprised of Slater, Curtis Axel, Adam Rose, and Bo Dallas. You might as well have called this group the Job Squad 2.0. They were the, the Job time, Squad 2.0. Some of the jobbingest jobbers to ever job, and much like their spiritual predecessors from '98, their luck did not improve once they became united. The outcast lasted for six months before the team was blown up in the 2016 draft, which famously ended with Slater being the one man on the whole roster who didn't get picked, but that's a whole other story. This next stable was, in my opinion, one of the worst in the last 10 years. It was horrific. It was heinous. You might call it an international incident. If it weren't for us putting up with these guys, we may never have been blessed with this. Acknowledge me. There's no way I was going to talk about WWE League of Nations history of shit teams uh, and not bring up the uh, uh, League of Nations. Oh my god. Uh, let's get over this train wreck. League of Nations. Two former world champions and a pair of very talented mid-card acts joined forces in November of 2015 and Alberto with the Del Rio. intent of getting beaten up by Roman Reigns. The group formed soon after Sheamus used his money in the bank to beat Reigns for the WWE title. He, Alberto Del Rio, Rusev, and Wade Barrett united for reasons that were never really explained besides that they were all from different countries and kind of hated America. This foursome was looking to make a statement, and they did just the that. The Un-Americans, they were not. When they lost by countout to Roman Reigns in a four-on-one handicap match. Did I mention this was taking place during the time when they really wanted us to like Roman and would do almost anything to that end? This did not help. I get having your hero fight off a big threat, but what threat was there? Nothing no threat. More of a threat in wrestling. It was a League of Nations. Guys, one of which is no the threat there. Champion, running away from one man in a flak vest. You know what's really sad? Vincent Mann got the fans to cheer for Reigns more than the full-time wrestlers ever could. Sheamus lost the title to Roman three weeks after winning it, while Del Rio traded the U.S. title back and forth to Kalisto. And besides their attempts to thwart the big dog in the 2016 Royal Rumble match, there was very little else for these guys to do as a collective unit. They managed to pick up a win against the New Day at WrestleMania 32 in Dallas, only to immediately get beaten up by Steve Austin, Shawn Michaels, and Mick Foley. Yeah, oh, almost like they were matters. useless. The League of Nations took four guys and made them all look worse than before. And what's worse, they didn't even help make Roman Reigns any less hated. Truly one of the most frustrating things WWE had done creatively during that time period. 
Now, I don't want you to think this video is just being done for me to bash WWE. There are a lot more companies out there that have done dumb things with large groups of people. Take, for instance, AEW. Aces and eights. Like I said, oh, wait, AEW. Video, if there's one thing AEW knows how to do, it's make stables. For a time, it felt like a new group was debuting or forming every week, though things seem to be settling down as of this recording. And like any other company, AEW has already had its fair share dark of success. Order. And Always was horrible. Never liked a Two dark words. order. Nightmare Collective. I know Brandy Rhodes. That third word, one of the biggest head scratchers in the company's early Brandy Rhodes, Karma, Brandy and Rhodes some other heel, girl. But then got all weird and vaguely mystical as she and Awesome Kong would cut people's hair. They added Melanie Cruz and Luther Who? to the mix, but by the time anything Who the hell is Melanie Melanie Cruz? Kong was too hurt to work. No one cares. Their story and their motivations were already muddled as it is, not to mention most observers hated every second of this group on their screen. It just plain didn't work, which explains why Brandy hastily went back to normal in February 2020 as Cody was deep into his feud with MJF. Speaking of confusing and ineffective groups, how about the Hardy family? Uh, another bad Matt one. Matt Hardy referred to his big Matt Hardy tried, but it was bad. One things began normally enough as he started to manage private party. Then along came Butcher and the Blade, then the Hybrid Two, and before you know it, Matt had a big old group of people around him. As members of the group went down with injury or lost more and more matches, the team felt a lot more jumbled and scattered. Then Andrade latched on to make things feel even more busy. Man, that was even weirder when Andrade joined. In a similar fashion to its previous version. After Revolution this past year, the group finally imploded when Andrade and Private Party turned on Matt. This beatdown brought about the AEW debut of Jeff Hardy, and well, that was fun while it lasted. A lot yep. of AEW's characters Jeff Hardy got wasted again. these last three years, but I don't think one person or entity has had more growth for the better than the Dark Order. Uh, the Dark Order one... Yeah, let's talk about the Dark Order. Worst. Okay. Started out as Evil Uno and Sue Grayson. Coming out of nowhere, no one got no reception, and then he added more people. And I'm sorry to say, Brody Lee got attached to it. I know that he's dead, but I was never a Brody Lee fan. Even when he was in a wide family, he was so boring to me. I get why they're saying that he's the greatest ENT champion of all time, but really, I respect him as a man. Nobody talked batch. Shit about it, he never did anything bad from what I heard. Everyone's talking good stuff. But as a wrestler, Brody Lee was just awful to me. He has his fans. But I never enjoyed Brody Lee or Eric Rowan. I'm sorry. I'm just saying what I have to say. The Dark Order was bad, always will, always has been. I skip every segment that they're in. Fast forward every time they go in there. I just don't like the Dark Order. One of the most beloved factions in AEW, a living and loving tribute to the legacy of Brody Lee. That was really good, the tribute to Brody, the Brody Lee, friended Hangman sorry, sorry, the Brody Lee tribute on AEW Dynamite was classic, class, that I watched, because it was Brody Lee, he just died, so that was classy of them, yeah. Page and helped motivate him in his quest to win the AEW title. It was genuinely one of the nicest things about watching Dynamite for a time. Mm -hmm. But let's be honest, it is a far cry from what the group was first like when it debuted. The Creepers. Evil Uno and Stu Grayson, known in the indies as the Player Super One Smash and Player Dose, made their mark on the very first AEW show, Double or Nothing 2019, flanked by their masked minions known as the Creepers. The group would wreak havoc on the roster while recruitment vignettes would air on TV. The group basically came off like a cult trying to target sad and angry dudes. They welcomed Alex Reynolds and John Silver into the group, which gave the team a bit more bite. Wait, but weren't they in there in the beginning? Full of dark and creepy I thought kids, they were always the in there from the beginning. The was a strangely odorless and flavor-free attempt to write a trend instead of creating something fresh and vibrant. Having local talent under the hoods didn't help as it made the order look cheap and not to be taken seriously. The problems of the group came to a head on the final Dynamite of 2019 when a sloppy second uh, by a horde of masked this experts thing. exemplified all the hokiness AEW had originally set out to not do. I mean, for God's sake, what are you punching, kid? He's punching the, the floor. Really alongside the equally pans Nightmare Collective, it's kind of a wonder they didn't get blown up along with it. The Dark Order's decline was apparently a factor that led to Tony... The fact that Nightmare Factory got this bad because people hated it and yet Dark Order is still around? Oh, Jesus Christ. ...taking over the booking duties and a storyline that promised to reveal the group's exalted one. 
Though some like myself scratched our heads at Mr. Brody Lee's original portrayal, his presence as the leader of the group absolutely righted the ship and made the Dark Order be taken much more seriously before his untimely passing. What began uh, I agree. He, he made the Dark Order a little bit more serious just by being there, but still... I'm not going to get into it more. I'm just saying I was never a Brody Lee fan, but RIP to the guy, like, respect to him, respect to him. And as one of the goofiest groups in AEW, ended up becoming one of its best. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, I can't believe I said that much bad stuff about AEW. Oh, God, I'm so ashamed. I feel so filthy. I got to DM Tony Khan right now and apologize this instant. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, I'm so sorry. I'm just go to the next clip, please, please. Hello? Hey, you there. That's right, you, John Q. WrestleFan. Reject the corporate overlords. Quit sucking the tea of sports entertainment and put all your money into abeyance coin. Seriously, please do it soon. Papa needs to cash out. The pandemic was a strange time for all of us. Everyone in the world, let alone in wrestling, was flying by the seat of their pants trying to figure things out. It was a genuine low point, so WWE decided to match that energy with Retribution, one of the most ill-conceived, <laughs> short-sighted ideas for a faction in the history of wrestling. In early August of 2020, Did I say Dark Order was the worst? Retribution is the worst. It started out strong, but then it just became retribution. Cocktail, tearing down the set and taking a chainsaw to the ring, these folks were basically Vincent Mann's vision of Antifa. The fact that this angle was happening as protests were happening and riots were breaking out across America was a coincidence not lost on many. On the surface, Retribution was presented as a group of disenfranchised Reckoning, wrestlers who felt they hadn't gotten Slapjack, the in the T-Bar, But the Mace. vibe was a little tone deaf, considering this was going on at the dawn of the great budget cut era. Maybe if the released wrestlers came back with this look, it'd be one thing, but these were just poorly disguised NXT call-ups who hadn't even been on the main roster long enough to be disgruntled. If anything, these guys and gals should have thanked their sweet bippies they were still around. That's right, I said bippies. Bippies. The wrestlers were all given very silly names. Dominic Dijakovic became T-Bar, Shane Thorne, Slapjack, Dan yeah. Madden Mace, yeah. Yim Reckoning, yeah. and Mercedes Martinez as retaliation. I forgot oh, about Mercedes Martinez. The group and was put back at NXT, so hopefully that turned out well for her. More pain. Oh. And team. she's gone. Yikes. So after weeks of fans asking why the hell have these folks not been arrested yet, the story finally hit a pivotal turning point that September when these violent anarchists bent on disrupting the corrupt system of WWE signed performer contracts with WWE. That made no sense. What? That makes no sense. What? That's right, these punk-ass crybabies abandoned their ideals the moment some money was thrown at them, then they were made to look like even bigger chump stains, losing the bulk of their matches and gaining no traction. It's like when Matt Hardy resigned with WWE in 2005, only instead of him, it was a bunch of people fans didn't care about. Then after all that, it was finally revealed that Mustafa Ali was the leader of the group, which led to even more losses until the team eventually ousted him as leader and went their separate ways. They ousted well, him as leader? That's how much I care about retribution. One guy in that I don't team, even pay attention. Shit, at least they won the tag titles what do these guys get out of it except some crappy names it was a storyline with a weak premise a flimsy execution zero payoff and a ramshackle ending that wasted everyone's time and energy in a business with a rich history of putting a bunch of people in a group and then doing nothing with them retribution has to rank up there as one of the most egregious examples but hey maybe it'll be some 13 year old kids equivalent of the job squad so what's no, your favorite group I don't of think so. losers in rest retribution will never be the I job squad 3.0 in the comment section below I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time. Great video by the GOAT himself, Brian Zane. He went through all of it, and it's like, he, he pretty much said it all. He pretty much said it all. Retribution is the worst. I, I completely missed out on an NWA angle in WWE, and I'm so glad I did, because I wouldn't want to watch that. But anyways, that's it for now. For, for now, human annoyed. Bleah, bleah. That's how much Retribution fucked me up. I can't even speak anymore. Anyways, that's it for now. Humanoid Nation, humanoid freak out. Bye. Pasito a pasito, suave, suavecito. Nos vamos pegando poquito a poquito.